recording. Okay, I'll just do a quick little intro. Well, hi everybody, how are you doing? Today is Tuesday, August 22nd, 2017. And uh, this is our third live session for our mobile learning design sprint. Uh, for Designers for Learning, my name is Jennifer Madrill. I'm sitting here in Chicago, Illinois, and uh, we've got Angela Gaffin with us, and hopefully more people will join as we're, as we're going. Um, but this is great. Angela is um, not currently enrolled in the course, but is um, considering it, and also has uh, colleagues who, from her program in uh, at Emporia State who've taken some of our courses before. So what I thought I would do is we're just kind of waiting for people who might come in and have questions about their project and that's really the purpose of these webinars is um, to keep them fairly informal and so people can just pop in and ask questions when they have them. Um, so what I think I'll do is share my screen and um, let's see, let's hop over to actually the class. So let me get on to the uh, page of what you'll see. Okay, so I'm gonna share my screen and um, Angela, if you could let me know if you see what you see. Um, you know what? I'm uh, yep, I can. Yeah, I can see that. I think you know what I'm going to stop. Now I see it. you again. Yeah, I'm going to stop it and just have it right on my. Um, let's see if I can get you just on Google. Um, you don't need to see all my uh, other junk there. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so do you just see my, um, my like my web browser? It looks the show hopefully. Yeah. Okay, excellent. Okay, so um, the the course, and I'll put let me put a, um, a link in the text chat here for. Um, how to find this page that I'm on right now. So we'll have a text chat. When I put the recording up, there'll be a text chat, a link to the text chat. Um, but for now, I'll give it to Angela. Okay, there's the, this is the page I'm on. So this is um, Thinkific, and I'll just spend a couple seconds talking about Thinkific and why we, um, why we chose it. It's, um, it's a, a, an alternative to a traditional learning management system that you may be familiar with, um, that you may have used in college or you may um, use when you're teaching classes at a university or in K-12. Um, it's for people like Designers for Learning who have um, uh, yeah, the need to teach kind of one-off classes and um, it has a lot of the same features of an LMS except it is, um, uh, you can also charge uh, for students, which we're doing in this class. And just to let everybody know, most of our courses um, to this point, literally thousands of people have taken our courses for free, but we are a 501c3 um, nonprofit. And so we're offering this as a professional development course, the mobile learning strategies course for $20 and 100% of the proceeds go toward um, funding our nonprofit. So keeping the lights on, paying our filing fees and our insurance and other things that we need to do. And I'm donating, donating my time 100% um, for uh, pro bono to both design this course as well as to facilitate it. So you may want to kind of keep an eye out on what we're doing in this space because we're going to, um, we're designing right now a design thinking course um, that will start um, sometime in early 2018. And um, this is one of the first, our first tries at doing this. Um, and you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to mute real quick or ask everybody if you could just mute, mute, mute your audio. I'm kind of picking up some background noise. Hang on a second. Let me, let me just mute. There we go. We're still getting some background noise here. There we go. Much better. Okay, thanks, sorry about the interruption there. Um, so let's just go ahead. So this is what you'd see if you, you want to scroll through and read what the course is about. Um, we're using um, a book which is not required for purchase at all, but if you're interested in the, um, the design approach we're taking, it's actually a, a design sprint approach that was developed by Google Ventures. Yes, that Google. Um, it's what they use when they are considering trying a new initiative. It's a, um, a prototyping and testing and user testing um, process that they have developed and then, and then turned it into a book. And so it's a five, for them, it's a five-day face-to-face design process to work on with their design teams. We have converted that to something that you can work on independently as a self-study initiative. And um, instead of a five-day design process, we're taking a five-stage process. So we're going through all the same design um, approaches and techniques that they are using, but we are, instead of having it as a five-consecutive day event, we're extending it to allow people to take it um, when it makes time and it makes sense um, for them. And so here, if you want to read on that front page, this gives you a little idea of what the design sprint is all about. And what I wanted to also just reinforce is this really is a service learning experience. 
we are um, asking everyone who joins the course to um, consider the adult basic education need and think about ways that we can use off-the-shelf mobile device ap applications, so, so some application you could use on your phone, your smartphone, or on a tablet um, that a student could use, and um, use that off-the-shelf application to facilitate some type of learning experience. And the um, idea is to go to our existing repository of lesson plans. We've, in our MOOCs, developed about 90 lesson plans. They've been designed by people who take our MOOC. And the idea is to go back and look through those, which are primarily, to this point, designed for a face-to-face -face environment. So it's where an adult education student would go to an adult education program, maybe at a library, maybe at a church basement, wherever it may be. And so most of um, the lesson plans are geared toward people being face-to-face -face with their instructor. And so what we'd like people to contemplate is how could you take some component of that existing lesson or add a component to the lesson that the students could do on their own using a mobile device. And so let's just hop into what the class looks like real quick. So it looks a little different. This is my interface. Um, it's not going to be the same um, for you. I can't actually recreate what you see exactly, but I'm going to go into the course as though you were, um, as though you were a member. Okay, let's see why this is not opening for me. Come on. Anyway, two classes. There we go. And I'm going to preview the course as though I were a student. So your interface will look something like this if you, um, if you join. So along the left, these are the, um, this is the content, um, all the different things that you can, um, you know, start and read about the course uh, once you're in. So here are five phases. So we're, uh, the first phase is talking about the design opportunity, um, talking a lot about the learner, the context, and the need. The second uh, phase of the design sprint process is ideation, and that's really coming up with ideas um, that you could potentially use um, as, a, as a focus for your project. Once you kind of narrow things down in that second phase, phase of the design sprint, um, then it's on the, the third phase is deciding um, what you're going to be doing and then storyboarding that learning experience in the third phase. And then in the fourth phase, you'll prototype. And we're asking you to concentrate on about a 15 minute time on task for the learner. So these aren't huge learning activities that you're designing. And the idea is really for you to focus more on your process. Again, going through this five phase process of really thinking about the need, thinking about the learner, thinking about potential learning experiences you could design then store, storyboarding and prototyping it. And then what's really, for me, I think kind of fun about this course is, and, and the design for sprint concept, it's heavily it emphasizes user testing. And um, so I'm gonna click on here real quickly um, just to give you a sense of what, what I'm talking about. Um, we really rely pretty heavily on um, two books and again, you don't need to purchase the books, but just more from our perspective as the developers and designers of this course, what are, where our thoughts were um, in designing this, is this whole concept of a loss, your lease, user testing. So um, it, I think a lot of people discount the value of having basically anybody look at your design and try to go through it. Um, there's always, there uh, seems to be a, this desire to have um, you know, per perfect testing conditions with um, exactly the users that you may be uh, working with. And um, what, what's really appealing to us is in, in using two books, uh, one is from Steve, Steve Krug called Don't Make Me Think, and then also the design approach within, um, within the design sprint book itself from Google Ventures, is this idea that really the magic number is kind of around three to five people to user test your designs. And so the, the idea being here, you're going to get pretty repetitive information after about the third to the fifth person looking at your, your design, looking at and trying your prototype. And so it becomes kind of diminishing returns after three to five people. And so really that is the premise of what we're doing. We'd really love you to grab your kids, your spouse, your significant other, maybe your neighbors down the hall. Uh, and, and again, maybe two, three, four people at most, and have them go through your prototype. So here's an example. This is my husband's hands here. This is our laptop from home. And I asked him to go through the example that I created for this course. 
And even just having him test it, clearly um, he's not from our target audience, um, but he, um, he had never worked with the application that I had used as my, uh, the basis of my learning, uh, my instructional um, intervention. And so he went through all the processes of trying to, as I've instructed him to do, how to download it, how to record his own voice, um, and then I had him go through the, the other activities that were part of the lesson. And I got a lot out of it. I realized that I had some things out of order, and he found a few things that looked different on his phone than looked different on mine. Um, and so even with just that one user test, I was able to really get, um, get quite, a lot, quite a lot out of it. So um, again, going back to this idea of like, why would you take this course? I think these are really some cool tips and pointers for those that are going to be designers and are having a hard time mirroring, uh, matching up what you've maybe learned in school as part of theory and maybe some research you may have done to actually what things are like in the field. And that's the beauty for me of the design sprint is it was developed by people who do this every day at Google, who design new user experiences. And so we're borrowing some of those heuristics, those uh, the little things, little tech tips and techniques that they use as designers to go from an, an idea, uh, a need for the learner, all the way through to prototyping and then um, testing with users. Um, so with that, I'm just gonna pause a second and I'll unmute um, Angela and Sabrina. I don't know if you uh, had any questions on that overview, like a 10 minute overview, and anything, um, anything strike you about that? Have you ever um, done any type of thing, uh, design sprint like this or gone through a design process like this? I haven't. I mean, they, the company that I work for uses a, a sprint philosophy in terms of some of the work that they do in their IT space, but it's not something I've actually been part of before. Yeah, it's, um, I hadn't really, when you look, when you break down uh, the, the, those five steps that I showed, it really kind of follows a typical design model where you have an analysis phase and you do your design and you do your development and implementation and evaluation. It's just, what I, I kind of like about it, this is this whole idea of this lost your, lost your lease and you have to, you know, <laughs> you've got to get this done or you're, you know, you're running out of money and, and we've got to, we've got to get this thing off the ground aspect of it because that really kind of replicates what you really experience in real life in a lot of cases where you don't have a ton of money and you don't have a lot of people from your target audience that are just sitting there waiting to, um, to, to test your things and, and give you feedback. And um, Sabrina, I haven't had a chance to chat with you. I'm not sure if you have your mic. Where are you at? And are you taking the course now or thinking about taking it? Not sure if Sabrina's got her. Oh, okay. So Sabrina, I'm just putting in the text chat. It's her first time, and she's new to the field. Okay, great. That's awesome. Um, we have, I would say, 80% of the people who join our programs are either in a career transition or they're just finishing up a master's program and feel the need to get experience before they go out and try to interview and want to add some artifacts to their um, portfolio. Oh, great. Okay, so Sabrina's saying um, she doesn't have her mic set up for to be able to talk to us. So I'll just kind of read what she's saying. Um, she's on module three, so she's in the part of the part of the class um, uh, where she's started to storyboard her her design idea. And feel free, Sabrina, if you wanted to type some questions about your project. And also, I, this is probably a good time to let me flip over to. Um, I think I had it pulled up. Let's see if I can find it. Let's see, okay, let me put the link in the chat here. If you hop over to Padlet, we have a Padlet going, and that's also a fun tool if you've never used it. That's another thing we do in the course is we try to pepper through the course in different places, um, applications that you may find valuable either as a designer to collaborate with others or that you may wanna use with students that you're working with. And Padlet, if you haven't used it yet, Oops, I'm sending this privately to Angela. Let me make change that here. Sorry about that. Um, so there's the uh, the link to Padlet, and um, the this is the Padlet we're using for this course, where people can post their storyboards. So you may have um, you may want to just peek over here and see how things look. So here's the, the the storyboard showcase. We've got a few of them that came in. Let's see. I'll open this one from I think this is from Becky Parton. 
gives you a sense of what she's working, how she, how she did it. So um, you can see what her script is that she would have uh, for each of the sections of her lesson. And I think she kept it to about, yeah, I think she had about nine different uh, slides that she used as part of her prototype. And then again, she would use this as then to test with her users. Oh, cool. Okay, so Sabrina's saying she'll add her storyboard to Padlet soon. That's great. And one thing that's really hard in a class like this, where we started out, it was going to be a three-month course, and now we're extending it to December. Everybody's at different places, which is fine. Fine with me. I don't care. But it makes it a little bit harder for those that are trying to get some peer-to-peer -peer interaction and, um, and share with each other. Everybody's at a little bit different phase of, of the course which is why we're having these live sessions, try to kind of bring everybody together to ask some questions. Um, and then I think I'll just spend two, two or three minutes just showing you where this will all end up. So as I mentioned, we have, this is our adult learning zone. This is on OER Commons. This is where we store all of, all of the lesson plans that were designed by our participants in our MOOCs and in our courses. So as I said, we've got about 90 uh, resources right there. Here are some of the ones that have most recently come in. Um, so let's pull this one up. As I just showed you the Padlet a moment ago from um, Becky Parton. Let's see, here is her, what it looks like in OER Commons once you have everything done. So when you go to um, the resource, let's open it up. Here is a summary of what her lesson is about. These are all things that are explained within the course, how to set this up. Um, she has a description of the lesson, which is really important because this is sitting out on a platform called OER Commons. And the idea is that adult educators can come out because they're going to be aware that these resources are there as part of a group um, and come through, read the abstract and what the lesson is about. And then see, and this is a very important thing, we're aligning all of our lessons to the college and career readiness standards. So when you go through the lessons that, that are in, in a, that are potential targets for you to add a mobile learning component, this is all within the lesson already. So we're not spending a ton of time um, talking about how we got to this point, but this is just to give you a sense for when you pull up the lesson, this is what you'll see, the lesson description, which goes on a bit. And then you start getting into the actual lesson artifacts. So there's downloads of uh, PDFs that are either worksheets for the student that the, the instructor will use as a handout, um, and then also the lesson itself. It will take, it will show what the, uh, the, how this fits within the context of a, of a larger curriculum, the relevance to the practice, um, some of the key terms and concepts that the learner will be learning. And then it gets into the real nuts and bolts of what the learner experience is looking. Like so for Becky's lesson, it starts up with a three minute warm up um, using um, some of the prompts that the instructor will be using in the live class. And here's what she's introduced. So she's introduced by a, a mobile app, um, this 15 minute exercise, um, and it's on, on about idioms. And um, so follow the steps in this link. Let's click on it and see what happens. It's always fun to click live <laughs> to see if things are actually there. So she's using an app called Marvel. And um, so this is a, an activity then that the student would go through and, um, and do on their phone. And so this is the segment, the 15 minute lesson that Becky added to that existing lesson plan. So that's kind of how this all comes full circle. And just to give you a real quick sense of um, how you can trace all this, if you go to version history, this, ele this lesson was originally designed by one of a, a participant in our MOOC in 2016, Alex um, Ellerington. And um, she put this together in, in, again, one of our MOOCs in 2016. And then when Becky came along as part of our mobile learning design sprint, she remixed the resource, which is simply means making a copy of it, and then added, as it showed down here, it, she added her section on the, um, the mobile learning app. And so, as I said, we've got four people who finished so far for this summer, and um, we've got 156 people chugging away, so we'll get a lot more as, as this um, summer concludes and we go into the fall. And I'll put the links of those that have completed in the, um, in the text chat for this recording. Uh, but I just wanted to give you a sense what it looks like. And then, then the really cool thing about all of this is putting, again, a, putting things into perspective and big picture. This fall, we're teaching um, a free, it's going to be a free MOOC um, like we've done 
every, uh, pretty much every semester since 2014. And um, let me put that in the chat, text chat. And it's a, if you click on that link, it will take you to Canvas. And so I'll go ahead and click on it myself. And the course is an instructional evaluation service course. And so what the participants in our upcoming fall course, again, it's free, it starts September 25th. What they're going to do is go back and look at, take a, a resource of their, a lesson plan of their choice out of that 90 that I mentioned a moment ago, pick out one of those resources to evaluate and adapt. So maybe when they go through the evaluation, maybe it's a great resource, but they would like to think about it in a, dif in a different context. So for maybe example, the lesson was originally written in English and uh, for an, an all English speaking um, audience, but maybe they'd like to adapt it and kind of contemplate how that lesson could be adapted for a course uh, that's primarily um, students who wear English as a second language. And so there may be um, either from minor to significant changes that they want to make on that lesson. So the original lesson will still reside out on OER Commons as the original lesson. And as I showed, you make a copy and you remix it. And you're, you're, during this course, you'd make ad adaptations and changes to the lesson. And so that whole approach to evaluation is called developmental evaluation. It's um, a really, um, to me, appealing way to conceive of evaluation. It's not so much looking back at a resource or a lesson plan or um, some lesson materials and thinking about what's wrong with it necessarily because I think that's kind of the idea most people think of evaluation is okay we're gonna go pick this apart and pick out all the things that went wrong with it it's much more of a forward-looking approach to evaluation thinking about okay this was made for a particular context and for a particular need and, and while it may have, may have hit the mark on that if you shift your focus a little bit or think about it in a different context with a different learner group as we've done in our CAT class, maybe we want to think about moving some of the um, some of the implementation to online or to mobile learning. What what types of adaptations and things would I need to to change? And again, it's to me, it's a much more positive type of evaluation approach than sometimes you we um, experience when we think about evaluation in terms of nit nitpicking problems um, with it. So that's a real fun class. We people really liked it last year. We had about 800 people sign up. And uh, we had real positive feedback. So this is the second time we're offering this course. And again, it starts September 25th, um, if you'd like to enroll. Um, so with that, I'm going to really stop talking. I have to ramble for like 20 minutes <laughs> to give an overview. But um, Angela or Sabrina, did you have any questions or, or comments? Or Actually, I'd really love to also hear courses you might like us to consider teaching in the future that would help you as you're preparing for your, for your future careers. I think the the one thing that could be interesting is simply to look at different topics from both a higher ed perspective and a business perspective, uh -huh. just because some of the expectations of the, um, not the audience, but, you know, like your management. Um, your stakeholders. Would be uh -huh. over the, yeah, the, those, those would be different. That's, I'm and I, I think that it, <laughs> it can it can give you a greater appreciation for your own environment if you have an idea of some of the challenges in the others. That would be great. Okay, let's kind of design this as we're sitting here. <laughs> That's how we work at Design is Learning. If you come up with an idea, then you've got to, you've got to run with it. So let's run with it. Um, so what could we do? Could, would, would it work if we had... Um, Practitioners in various fields, like someone from higher ed, someone from corporate, someone maybe from K-12, maybe in a nonprofit, and we, you know, ask them how they, like, are you most interested in thinking through kind of a day in the life, like how, what their, um, what, what they need to do to satisfy their constituencies, whether it's the clients they work with, the learners, or people, is that kind of what you're thinking? Yeah, and just, but also just, you know, getting buy-in because I know, for yeah. example, we had a situation where there was a course that was designed to, um, <clears throat> it, it was an awareness program and it had been just a very, you know, ongoing, oh, PowerPoint slide, talk over it, PowerPoint mm -hmm. slide, talk over it, and a 
revamp was done to use more interaction mm -hmm. um, and the, the the stakeholders came back and said basically no you need to use exactly what we gave you and don't change the wording because then you start changing the meaning and and just how do you kind of work around that to actually create instruction that people want to participate in mm -hmm. um, you know I, I can click through all day long and if your if your objective is for me to truly improve my knowledge but you've designed that training in such a way you know and your management is forcing you to present it in such a way that that's all it's really requiring I mean you can I can click the checkbox that somebody went through it but I can't validate that they actually learned anything yeah and so what are the, the challenges that you know you're facing and how do you how do you get that buy-in what what samples can you show them that says here's the old way and here's the improved way you know on something small to help make that change at a bigger scale Okay, so I'm typing this. I literally am typing this as you're going because this probably will be one of our classes. We'll <laughs> that's how we come up with stuff. We're like, okay, let's do it. So I'm thinking of common, um, it's almost like consulting skills for designers. I taught that class once. Um, it, mm -hmm. and, I'm, and so what we did, kind of what you're trying to say, we came up with common challenges that would come up kind of throughout the design process, working with stakeholders. Um, where you have, um, first of all, everything you're doing is a change to the organization, right? Or you're hopefully trying mm -hmm. to change something. And so inherently with change, you're going to run up against uh, roadblocks along the way. Um, so a lot of the challenges we came up with were is, is exactly as you described, that um, they have an idea, they bring you in as an expert, subject matter expert, but at the end of the day, they want you to keep continue doing what they've been doing and get different results, right? <laughs> right. <clears throat> And so um, some of those consulting skills for how do you, um, you know, sh show, show benefit and how do you tie that, and a lot of times it's aligning it to, as you're talking about, to um, benefit down the road. So reaching goals that um, are measurable and that showing that there is progress, not just giving a shovelware dump of either read mm -hmm. this pamphlet or, you know, click through these slides. So that would be great. Okay, so the one you came up with, I'm thinking of some of the things we could do is, um, uh, how do you how do, how would we describe that one you just said the um, um, like uh, not, basically not just repeating what we're doing right is that part of it too like um, I'm trying to think of a theme what theme would that kind of fall under well you you could I just it, one of the, the ways that you phrase the statement is I think it is it Einstein who made the comment that insanity is doing the same thing yeah. same thing over and over again and, and expecting different results. Uh, mm -hmm. So so maybe even just calling the course insanity, it definitely would pique people's interest. <laughs> That's a great one. Okay. Okay. Um, so um, expect look, insanity, and then I'm gonna put that as like expecting a different outcome. Without changing how your approach. Without changing approach. Okay, that's great. How about some of the things, um, and I'll, I see Rachel's here. Hi, Rachel. I, I'll unmute you um, and Sabrina too. Hello. There you Hi. Hi. We've kind of diverted off of our uh, mobile learning sprint. Um, just let me finish up a quick conversation here, and then I'll, I'll see if you have any questions about our project. Um, how about anything in terms of like apprehensions you may have um, going into a role? Like, is there anything that um, either from the interview process and getting your portfolio ready, or is there anything that um, either Angela, Sabrina, or Rachel that you're thinking would be you know, valuable to spend some time thinking through with others in the course? Can you rephrase it? Um, what were you asking? <laughs> Yeah, we're kind of, we diverged from our mobile learning strategies. Sorry about that. We're thinking now kind of bigger picture, what you'd like to see designers for learning help you know, put a professional development course together. And so um, a lot of people who join Designers for Learning and join our projects are people who are either career changers or they're winding down um, a master's program and are looking for a, a job opportunity. And so they're trying to build a portfolio or try to get a better, better understanding of what's going to be expected for them on the job. 
And I just wondered, is there anything in particular that you'd like experience, more experience on or um, take part in a class that would focus on some aspect of, what, of, of that whole process of, of either changing a career or um, getting yourself ready for your next career? Yes, <clears throat> I would say in my role, moving from more of a uh, support role to either, you know, administrative role. And so kind of how does it look for me still staying in the same um, career path in instructional design? Um, so I have some concerns there or looking for ways to maneuver through that. And if that answers your question. Yeah, yeah. And so, wait, Rachel, are you um, are you currently an instructional designer? I am. Yeah, I've been in instructional design for seven years, and um, again, uh, having some opportunities to uh, play around with some leadership roles. But I just think I've kind of burned myself out <laughs> in this current role, so I, I don't necessarily want to be over. You know. A division or anything like that, but definitely just trying to move. Uh, I don't know, wherever it's supposed to develop it to, just trying to see what my career path is is going to lead me next. So, yeah. yeah. And I just just to make you feel better, you are not alone. On our website, <laughs> we have on our contact page, we have one simple question. It just says, um, describe your interest in designers for learning. And I don't just get like a paragraph. I sometimes get like a page. <laughs> 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 it's just exactly what you said, you know, I right. love my job, but it's, you know, kind of a dead end or I'm getting, you know, I was just laid off or right, you know, right. I a couple classes and I'm really interested in online learning and I think I could make a transition. So, um, um, so that's kind of our next thought, big picture for designers for learning. How can we help people through those kind of transitions and, and think through, even though everybody's coming at it a little bit differently. Um, it sounds like you have a lot of, are you in a higher ed setting right now that you're doing instruction? I am, for? yeah, I'm in higher ed. And then it's funny, cause you mentioned something <clears throat> just a moment ago in the current role I'm in, where it's the same role, but new institution. And <clears throat> there's not a lot of structure as far as the ID process. And so <clears throat> that's the, one of the reasons why I joined the mobile, my, my boss actually recommended it to me mm -hmm. and I joined it. Um, to try to get an idea and look at some alternative ways and alternative approaches to, you know, help support the faculty uh, through developing quality online courses. So, yeah, I, I am in higher ed. I've been in higher ed the entire time. Uh, I came from training and development, so I, little, I did a little instructional design there while I was in grad school. But since graduation, I've actually worked in the role as an ID in um, higher ed, four-year university, and now community college setting. So um, what we were trying, I don't know if you were logged on when, um, when uh, Angela was speaking, but this whole, I think, and you don't have to name names because I know people probably might recognize where you work or recognize you, but uh, we hear a lot from people who are in instructional design and higher ed. When you're working with, you know, for example, tenured faculty who know their subjects incredibly well and have been teaching forever, um, but you're coming in as the um, instructional designer to help either move the class from a face-to-face -face setting to online or think of, as you're saying, some more creative, different ways. Um, you know, that, that, that's a consulting skill that's really, really valuable because clearly you have a lot of, to add to the table as far as, um, in the conversation as far as instructional strategies. But at the end of the day, it's their, their course, their material, they're the subject matter experts in it. And, um, yeah. And so, I mean, again, you don't have to, like, name names or anything like that, but do you run into that where you kind of, you Oh, know, yeah, that, that uh, yell of academic freedom yeah. <laughs> is always at the, uh, the top of every conversation when it comes to revising courses or just trying to assist with course development. Lucky for me, I do have over 12 years of HR consulting. So okay. it comes natural. <laughs> so, okay, this is perfect. Okay, you guys are going to help me design my next class. <laughs> great. This is great. So, like, when you said you have the HR, you know, the consulting skill, like, what, just name a few skills that you feel are really valuable to those conversations. When, like, I, and I'm, I'm typing, let me, before I forget it, you said academic, okay. academic freedom, you put it down there. I love that. I'm going to use that one. Yeah, because it's, okay. it's their course, they're the subject matter expert, so you never want them to feel like, you know, you're coming to tell them what to do, right? Because they're adults, and then it's their course, their content, and so they, uh, you know, you want them to own it. And then for me, as far as consulting, it's definitely you have to sell them something, 
And so from the start, um, I'll just kind of show them courses that I've developed uh, in their discipline or something close to their discipline. Uh, just so, okay, this is what you're getting out of it. You coming into this process of instructional design, this is what you're going to get out of it. We're working with me and uh, kind of getting their buy-in that way and then taking what they have. So you, again, you'd never want to say, let's do this or that. No, let me look at what you have. And then how can we make it work, uh, fit into this framework, you know, with regard to learning theory and uh, uh, your course being aligned. So I use some of these terms that across the board, they'll understand, okay, if something is aligned, what? It lines up, it fits together, jointly together. And so I kind of use a conceptual, I guess, strategy to kind of lead them through it. Uh, we do a lot of course mapping or storyboarding. Um, and I, the benefit of that is it takes time to, to map a process, to do storyboarding at the same time. When it comes to being flexible, which as a faculty, you need that. I don't care if you're tenured, if you're new, you adjunct. So that when your dean or coordinator comes to you and say, okay, Jennifer, I want you to teach a four-week course. And you're like, this is a 16-week course. Okay, I have my course map. I can take out whatever I don't need right mm -hmm. or I can add to it if it's a four week and they want me to expand it to eight weeks or 16 weeks so I tell them the benefit of that too as far as managing that course that flexibility you know mm -hmm. and and so it's it's been a good experience again I believe that my HR experience kind of it gave me some uh, useful tools that I can uh, more effectively work with faculty and so it's it's been pleasant for me That's uh, right. Oh, yeah. okay. This is great. Okay. We are definitely doing this class then. <laughs> so we're going to go to, I don't know what will build it. I, I like that, you know, Angela mentioned the insanity, like expecting different outcomes without changing the, the approach. I mean, that to me, that just cracks me up. But because um, that tends to be, you know, and I, I, everything you're saying, I've, I've typed down. So the academic reading piece that the aspect that when you're the designer, you are selling that you're selling your skills and you're selling them on um, your expertise and um, framework and approaches that have worked for you. And so you need to show them that you can't just assume that they're going to automatically buy into what you're doing just because that's your, that's your title. And some of the things I also wrote down is um, this idea of the course mapping and the storyboarding. A lot of people think that's such a waste of time. You know, why don't we just get right in and start, you know, you hear about rapid prototyping and let's start developing. Um, but to your point, I don't think there's been a t class that I've ever taught as an adjunct where it wasn't either just thrown at me or I had, all I had was a syllabus and then someone would say, oh, you know what, we don't have live classes anymore. You know, this is going to be all asynchronous or conversely, it's, it was asynchronous and now we're going to make, you know, make you have eight live sessions and you just have to still be able to take your course and, and adapt it and, and without having that, that course mapping and the storyboarding, that's really... Um, Definitely. Yeah, and you're, yeah, I'm reading the text chat here um, for focusing on customer support experience, yeah. And then Sabrina asked a question, let's see if we can, um, any advice to uh, how to start working with faculty development without experience? Ah, I'm looking for my first, okay, this is a part, Rachel, and I don't know if you want to take this one. So we get this a lot. Like, how do you jump in without a lot of experience? Maybe you. Yeah, you I did the same. Yeah, I had to do the same thing again. Coming from HR, I had that training and development experience, which is needed in the ID role. It is a support role. It's a, I feel like it's a role of a professional learner. So I focused on those two. I literally came from corporate mm -hmm. <laughs> into higher ed. Um, I started by taking on some adjunct uh, assignments as a, a business professor, just to kind of understand what faculty go through, you know, that side of it. Of course, in my master's studies, I actually focused on instructional design and learning theory, right? Mm -hmm. So you're going to have to, you're going to have to take on some practical knowledge and experience on your own, which you can do through things like this, you know, through this process that we're going through now or through OLC, uh, Flor formerly Sloan Consortium, get you mm -hmm. some certifications in ID. You know, if you don't want to go back and get a whole degree in it, you don't have to. You really don't have to. Right. So that's the route I took. And so I, I took that with me when I started applying for ID jobs. Hey, I've been in training and development, developing trainings, curriculum, curriculum development. It's the same across the board, right? It's either objective-based or it's going to be based upon some need. And so I, I kind of made sure that my, my resume stated that, right? So it was present there. 
training and development, developing curriculum. I, and I went back and looked at all of my jobs and how I was supporting, right? Supporting my colleagues, supporting a uh, higher up to direct reports in that way, because it's all ideas. You're giving that support and you're bringing with you that knowledge of learning theory uh, and things of that nature. So that's how I transitioned into the role. Uh, never would have imagined that I would be in yeah. this role, but that's how I did it. Yeah. 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 I started out, um, I have a bachelor's in finance, a master's in marketing, and I was an insurance underwriter for 17 years. So yeah, <laughs> we all have to go through that point of going, okay, what skills do I bring to the table that now transition to my new life? And then you build off of that by, as you said, getting your additional knowledge uh, up to speed with, with the theory, the, the, the all the models and all that you know there's kind of the two components like there's kind of the, the business skills what do i bring to the table from that standpoint to help this entity out and then um you know what can i bring to the table um so i think to, to answer that i think you did a great job answering sabrina's question she's looking for her first job and um, advice on how to start i always and i try not to give people a ton of advice because i you know i don't feel like i've reached that i have all the answers by any stretch but what has worked for me is and, and certainly hearing people, um, Rachel, you talk about your, your transition um, to a new field, is to really take stock in what skills you already have. Like you're probably very, very good at something. And you, you have a job, now you've been doing it, and, and just take stock and think about how those skills will transfer to the new job. And um, if you really think about the instructional design job or job, more than just the technical aspect of it, but the consulting aspect of it, it's really a people job. You're dealing with um, a lot of different stakeholders. You've got learners, you've got people who are um, asking you to do work, you've got people who are gonna help you. Maybe you're the designer and you have to work with developers and that's a whole uh, relationship dynamic to contemplate. And so think about all those interpersonal skills you already have and, and maybe have in your portfolio examples of it or at least talking points when you go on the interview, talking about how when you've, um, maybe, I think you said you were in IT, when you've worked with developers, because that's a big part of, for a lot of designers, is you do the design work, but then you have to be able to communicate your idea to a developer to actually carry out the task. And um, again, starting where you're at and what you've already done is a huge, I think, it gives you a huge leg up on, on the interview process. And, um, and then, yeah, Rachel, yeah, Rachel men mentioned that. She thought that was a good, um, not nearly enough experience <laughs> to give much advice here. Um, and then Rachel, I'm sure you're here for a reason. I, you, I'm sorry, we, we kind of moved on from the design sprint, but did you have any questions about your project, Rachel, or anything? Not yet, actually. I'm just getting, I haven't even started yet. I logged on to the course and paid for it, and I have not had the time to start, so I was happy when y'all expanded it because yeah. uh, I needed that. So it was an answer to a prayer because I was like, I'm going to miss this, and I got the book and everything. Oh, did you? I, I purchased the book. book. Yeah, and I, so I'm planning the semester just started so I can breathe for a few months. So I'm planning to start, if not this week, next week, reading my book and then start the uh, course. That's so awesome. I definitely will reach out to you as I um, work through it. That's great. And if you want to come back and listen, I'm, I'll post this recording after or the first part of the recording I talked about kind of the philosophy of the course, um, the approach that the design sprint is based off of the Google Ventures approach and um, what I was very very appealing as I mentioned I'll kind of repeat myself from the beginning is to me it's very on the on the ground it's developed by people who do design it's not instructional design work they just do product design for Google um, but it's that same idea those same skills of you ha you have to start as you mentioned the objective or the need so that's exactly what the design sprint does it starts with the um, talking about our learners and our context that we're working with and then this whole ideation pro product uh, process rather where you come up with potential ideas it's like you were talking about with your course mapping and your storyboarding it's like all the ideas that are out there at some point you have to bring that into defining what that experience is going to look like and for Google it's what's the user experience going to look like from our perspective it's what's the learners experience going to look like then we take it through that, um, uh, the storyboarding and the prototyping and then the user testing. And I think all the things we could talk about in this course, it really aligns with what we're talking about here. The idea is like taking these approaches and applying it in the real world. Um, as you said, you, you somehow need to have all the learning theory, you need to have the models in the back of your, you know, into your designer's toolkit. But at the end of the day, someone's going to be, be paying you to actually take something from an idea to a product, uh, whether that's an online course or whatever it may be. And I just really, that's why I really appreciate the approach that's taken um, within the design sprint. So hopefully, 
And then also too, it's cool that the mobile learning I think is something we all really need to have in our bag of tricks. And uh, not necessarily moving an entire course to so mobile learning, but finding um, little exercises, activities, um, things that people, everybody these days, uh, even we found in our adult education, adult basic education population, it's like the numbers I think are like 70 to 80% of, of, of that population has a mobile device in their hand. And so is there a way we can leverage that technology to help people, help, help people learn? So that's to me the exciting part of the design sprint. Um, okay, well I've kind of rambled more than I intended. Um, if, does anybody have any specific questions? Otherwise I think I'll uh, kind of wrap this up and, and post this as a recording, but I'm happy to take questions on any topic um, for the next 15 minutes or so, or we can just sign off whichever you prefer. Oh, I'll also mention too, please feel free to interrupt me and type your question. Um, what we're going to be doing going forward is having, um, it's I believe, don't quote me on this, I'll, play, I'll clarify it in the text chat when we uh, post the recording, but I believe it's the second Tuesday of every month we're going to be having a session much like this called Designer Dialogue. And we're going to be, ha we have a bunch of courses running right now. Uh, we're, we're probably by the first part of next year, we'll have three different courses going on. And so we think it will be um, fun to use this as an, a kind of free form ad hoc time slot. So again, the I think it's the second Tuesday. I think it's the second Tuesday, or second Thursday, sorry, second Thursday of every month. Um, and I believe it's 5 p.m. Eastern is what we put in our uh, tentative bank. But it, you'll see the bunch of announcements coming out of it. But the same idea. Let's just get together as designers and talk about things that are relevant, both the courses we're working on and then also our lives as designers. So any other questions, comments, suggestions? All right. Well, thank you guys very much for signing up for our course. And um, I, I'll put in the text chat again the link to our, um, our free course that we're starting in, on September 25th. It's, it's a fun class. People have um, enjoyed it in the past. So um, hope to see you in the future. Thanks, guys. Have a good week.